I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like, and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous episode of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, we started looking at the first letter of Peter. We learned a bit more about the Apostle and the situation that he and fellow Christians found themselves in during the first century AD when facing the terrible persecutions of the Roman Emperor Nero. We learn from this letter that Christians during times of trouble, persecution and suffering are assured of three things, a living hope, a present power and a rejoicing love, and that those assurances have a remarkable effect on their lives. First Peter is not an evangelistic letter. He is not explaining the significance of the cross as a means of evangelism. He is writing to those who reside, as he puts it, as strangers and aliens in this world, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. He is talking to believers here, and yet the heart of the letter is the cross. Why does he do this? The answer is in verse 6 and 7 of chapter 1. In this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter is talking about triumph and hope in suffering, the various kinds of trials which prove the quality of your faith and test it the way fire tests gold. I have always imagined Peter to be a very rough and ready man, one who was used to hard work as a fisherman and who was always practical and hands-on, as one might say. Peter doesn't leave the readers of his letters puzzling and scratching their heads as to how they could put all these wonderful theories and fine-sounding words into action. He is practical and to the point. The first section of 1 Peter, up to verse 12 of chapter 2, tells Christians who they are in Christ, what he has done for them, and how he has enabled them to withstand the trials and tests of persecution. From chapter 2, verses 13, Peter deals with the practical aspects of the Christian life. He shows them how they should live their lives as citizens. These are people who were living in the Roman Empire and facing persecution and yet they have certain obligations. In verse 17, Peter tells them to honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. What emperor? Nero, who drags Christians behind his chariot and burns them alive as torches in his garden? Honor this emperor? Peter, having already written that we should honor all people, knew that some Christians would resist honoring Nero the heathen Roman emperor who had mercilessly tortured and killed thousands of Christians in various cruel and demeaning ways. But Nero was emperor, and the emperor is to be honored, because he represents the office given him by God. Romans 13 verses 1 says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Whether the emperor is honorable or not, he is emperor, and God says we should honor him as such. If we are resisting the power he has, we are resisting what God has instituted. In Romans 13 verses 2 it says, Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. If Peter were writing today, he might say, Honor the president. No matter how defiled his name may become, God's people should resist the pressure to dishonor him or his office. This would have been very difficult for many Christians then. Many would have despised Nero's reckless, godless behavior. Some would certainly have had personal reasons to hate him. But the command of our king, however, remains the same. Matthew 6 verses 14 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, 
your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And Matthew 5 verses 44 says, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. When someone harms us, we instinctively want to take revenge. Peter says that Christians must never do that. When Jesus suffered, he did not retaliate. Even when they spat on him, mocked him and flogged him, jamming thorns into his forehead. Yet his response was to ask his father to forgive his enemies because they didn't realize what they were doing. Peter says that in the same way. We should never think of getting our own back. We should always repay evil with good, rather than seeking to get even. When we obey God's command to honor all people, we are following our heavenly King and honoring Him. Peter goes on and talks about servants in 1 Peter 2 verses 18 to 19. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all proper respect, not only to those who are good and kind, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if a person endures the sorrow of suffering unjustly because of an awareness of the will of God. Here God takes the immensely complex social system and reduces the proper conduct for Christians to one simple statement. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Such behavior goes against all human instinct, the very opposite of how we normally respond to injustice. When something is unfair, we generally say so. One of the earliest things children learn to say is, it's not fair. And you hear the same sentiments expressed in protest actions today. Peter is saying that Christians have no rights. As Christians, we really only have one right, and that is stated clearly in John 1 verses 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We all need to prepare for suffering by learning to give in and accept it. Peter himself perfectly demonstrated this attitude later when he came to be crucified himself. He didn't fight it, but insisted on being crucified upside down. Peter reminds them of the example of the Lord Jesus. He says in verse 23, When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He committed himself unto the Lord. You are probably noticing by now that Peter is working his way downward, from the emperor, through government authorities, to the attitude of Christian servants towards their masters. Another group that faced great suffering were Christian wives of unconverted husbands. This is a very difficult situation which causes great heartache. Often the tactic of Nero and his successors was to arrest a few members of the sect or their immediate family, who were then tortured and forced to accuse their own families and friends, thereby implicating the entire Christian populace. 1 Peter 3 verses 1 says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, They may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Peter tells wives to be subject to their husbands, which includes even the unbelieving ones. He gives advice on how wives can win their unconverted husband for Christ, which is again totally contrary to what tends to happen. Many pastors will tell you that when a wife is converted before a husband, she thinks the two things that she must do are firstly to preach to him, and then to pray for him. Peter says neither. In fact, he says that if you preach, that is the worst thing you can do. He says you have got to win him without a word. It is very important that wives learn to go along with their husbands, but far too many women rather go to Bible studies, leaving their husbands at home and feeling less and less like the head of the house. Very few Christian wives ever succeed by preaching to their husbands. By contrast, Peter says in verses 3 to 5 that it is not fancy hair, gold jewelry, or fine clothes that should make you beautiful. No, your beauty should come from inside you. The beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That beauty will never disappear. It is worth very much to God. 
It was the same with the holy woman who lived long ago and followed God. They made themselves beautiful in that same way. They were willing to serve their husbands. That is a simple program for Christian wives. Peter explains how the wife should become beautiful, but he does not explain how to be glamorous. The beauty is to be inward first. The outward will follow. Husbands have to live lives of submission to their wives as well. Peter only gives them one verse, but still its instruction is very clear. Husbands, in the same way, treat your wives with consideration as the weaker partners and show them honor as fellow heirs of the grace of life. In this way, nothing will hinder your prayers. This is 1 Peter 3 verses 7. Husbands are to live lives of submission by understanding the needs of their wives and seeking to fulfill those needs in a way that honors God. We are to seek to grow in understanding our wives, we are to seek to honor our wives, and we are to seek to protect our wives. Peter says that is so important that if we don't live this way, our prayers will be hindered. This means actually that it is sinful to not live in this way. It would be like going to the altar when we have something against our brother. We would have to go back and make right before we return to the altar to bring an offering. So, if we want our relationship with God to be right, then our relationship with our wives must be right. The final verse of Peter's commands to his readers shows Christians how they should act and behave and what their attitude should be in society. Finally, all of you be like-minded. Be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. That is the mark of a Christian in society. With that attitude comes a blessing. And here Peter quotes right out of Psalm 34. What man is there who desires life, and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil, and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous, and his ears towards their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Although most of 1 Peter is generally straightforward, there is one problem, a difficult passage in chapter 3 which has many different interpretations. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. The passage says that Jesus was put to death in the body and made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to those who were disobedient in the days of Noah's flood. And a few verses later says, For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. Many preachers have based their doctrine of a second chance for salvation after death on this passage, despite the fact that every other scripture says it is impossible. Death seals our fate, but here, apparently, Jesus did preach to those who had died. How should we understand it? This is an awkward passage to fit in with the general teaching of Scripture that death is the end of your opportunity of salvation. The key to that whole passage in chapter 3 is verse 18. For indeed Christ died for sins once for all, the just and the righteous for the unjust and unrighteous, the innocent for the guilty, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. We can be sure of several things in this passage, and once we establish those facts, it will make the understanding of this passage so much better. Christ 
physically suffered and died on the cross, but was made alive in the spirit. His physical body went to the tomb, but while his body was dead, his spirit was alive. He was moving freely in the spiritual realm. When he was in the spiritual realm, he went and made a proclamation. This verb, ikeruksen, can mean preach, but it really means to make a proclamation, to announce a victory, or to herald a triumph. Jesus Christ went somewhere to announce his victory over sin, death, hell, demons, and Satan. He had overcome and triumphed in his suffering. This is what the context of 1 Peter is all about. Triumphing in the midst of unjust suffering. Who was this proclamation made to? Was it to the spirits of dead people? No. The New Testament always uses the term spirits to refer to angels and never to men. The Greek noun pneuma is used here alone without a genitive qualifier. It occurs nowhere else in the New Testament with this sense. Furthermore, the spirits mentioned in this passage could not be men, as nowhere in the scripture are the souls of men ever said to be in prison. The spirits in this context must then be demons, that is, fallen angels. Christ went to proclaim his victory over demons. This is not a message of salvation because demons are forever damned. According to Hebrews 2 verses 16 which says, For as we all know, he, Christ, does not take hold of the fallen angels to give them a helping hand, but he does take hold of the fallen descendants of Abraham, extending to them his hand of deliverance. Who these fallen angels or demons are to whom Jesus proclaimed his victory have to be seen within the framework of verse 20 which states that they did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark. The ark took 120 years to build, during which Noah preached judgment sermons to a sinful people. We read in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 5 that during this time, the sons of God mated with the daughters of men and produced a race of giants, the Nephilim. If these sons of God were fallen angels, then the sin of Genesis 6 involved angels leaving the place where they belonged in an act of disobedience before the flood. And that agrees with what Peter mentions in chapter 3 verses 19 that Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Noah preached for 120 years, but his neighbors only thought he was a crazy man. In this difficult passage, Peter referred to Noah's ministry in order to illustrate the necessity of keeping a good testimony in spite of unjust persecution. We will struggle with these verses, but the key to this entire passage is 1 Peter 3 verses 18. There can be no argument about that verse. It has been described as a summary of the cross, the substitutionary nature of Christ's atonement, its finality, and its triumph in the resurrection. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 8.